Welcome to Revelation without a chapter title. Um, that's because this session is going to be a little different from all the other ones in the Revelation Bible Studies here on St. Paul's YouTube page. In that, we've just finished, we've gone through the first three chapters of Revelation. And in those first three chapters, we read letters to seven different churches in, in the early times of Christianity. And what I found very valuable when I taught this class in person was we kind of, at the end of those letters, we stopped for a second, we took a break, and we looked back kind of at all of the letters at once to kind of compare and contrast and apply them to our situation today. And then asking some follow-ups on that. So I, I want to, just like I did in the real class, I want to, in this virtual class, I want to take just a quick break to step into what did all of those letters look like and kind of as a whole, what lessons can we take away from them and how can we go forward in that way? So for that, I actually am going to minimize my video just like this. And I have this chart that I built. Um, so here has all of the different churches with the different aspects of their, their letter. If you, if you recall all the way back earlier in Revelation, we talked about how each letter did, there, there was a pattern to these letters. So we're going to walk through that pattern kind of as a whole to see all of the different ways um, that each of these churches is approached. And then, as you'll see in the bottom, we're going to kind of look at what does that look like for the church today. And obviously, I, I'm doing this for St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. But if you're watching this video and you don't necessarily belong to that church, uh, to our church, that, that is totally fine um, because those questions are not specific to St. Paul, just as they, they're not really specific to the church in Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum or Thyatira or any of these other ones. So with that kind of introduction framing our Bible study this session, we're going to start at the very top. As you'll recall, each each letter was introduced to the angel of the church at, and I didn't I, I didn't add a row for that because I don't think there's a whole lot of really in depth analysis we need to do that. We, we talked about what it means that they're writing to the angel, and if you want to have that discussion again, go ahead and go back and watch that video. Um, but then the second part of each letter is they they see a an image of Christ that is specific and is, is what the people at that church need to see. So in Ephesus, they're, they're reminded that God works in the midst of his churches. In Smyrna, they're reminded about an eternal and everlasting God. In Pergamum, they're reminded that the, the word is both convicting law and soothing gospel. In Thyatira, it really focuses on how pure God is, how powerful God is, and how consistent God is. And that consistency is really big. In Sardis, they're reminded that God is active in the life of his church, that he walks in the midst of his church. In Philadelphia, they're reminded simply that God has the power to save. And then in Laodicea, um, they're reminded that Christ was the true witness, the, that God is the source of all creation. And if you want to, again, if you want to look in detail about each of these descriptions and why they applied to the church that they were written to, I'd encourage you, go back and watch Revelation 1, 2, and 3. Um, but as we look at these letters, I think we can take comfort or we can take a lesson from each one of these as well. You see, God working in the midst of his churches, that's an excellent reminder to us that God works in the midst of his church. God God didn't just like say, okay, you're going to be the church. You're going to bring people to me and then leave us be. He is working in and amongst us, bringing people to faith, blessing his church, working through his church. The The next God that we see that I, I kind of want to lump together a few of these descriptions because they all kind of have to do with the characteristics of God. He's eternal. He's everlasting. He's pure and powerful and unchanging. And he has the power to save. He, he's the true witness, the source of creation. So this is Smyrna, Thyatira, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Um, so what we see in all of these is we see how incredible our God is. And it's valuable to remind ourselves of that, especially because 
I, I think we have a tendency to forget how incredible God is. There, there's this tendency for us to want to picture God um, as things he's not. Uh, there are some people who kind of like God to be a senile old grandpa. Like he's really nice, but he doesn't know what's going on. Or there are, there are people that like God to be a teddy bear and, and he's kind of just there to comfort you. And there are, there are people who think God's like a genie and you just make wishes to God. And, and if he likes you enough, he follows, he like, he makes your wish come true. And none of those are who God is. God is eternal and everlasting. He is pure and powerful and unchanging. God has the power to save. He's the true witness. He's the source of all creation. Um, so it helps remind us to not put God in, in some little convenient box for us. As we move forward, we have Pergamum. We, we're reminded that the word has both convicting law and soothing gospel, which... Um, if you are in the Lutheran tradition, if you're in our tradition, all of our theology, or maybe not all, but a, a, a large part of our body of theology comes from this reality that the word is both law and gospel, that there is that dual functionality to the word. Um, so always a good reminder and, and kind of bringing us back to that foundation Um then walking forward into Sardis, again, just as in Ephesus, God is an active spirit in the life of the church, um, which I think is a really good reminder, because if you look at America, if you look at the state of Christianity in the world, it's pretty easy to become discouraged. But if we remember that God continues to work in his church, I think that that's a really helpful thing to keep before us, that even if it doesn't look like we think it should look, God is still doing work in the midst of his church. Um, now, is that an excuse to not do anything about the, the the negative trends we see in the church, about things we see in the church that are happening that shouldn't be happening, um, things in society that are happening that, that shouldn't be happening? No, we, we still need to speak up. We need, need to do work in those situations. For example, the trend of, of people moving further and further away from the church, that's a call to action for us. God is going to continue to work through his church, but we need we, we ought to be the church. We ought to be out in our communities doing mission, telling people about the gospel, being the hands and feet of Christ. Um, when we see things like corruption in the church or we think we, we see things in the leadership of the church that are it's more about pride or money or or status or something like that, we need to speak up and say that's not what we're called to do. But if we start to get discouraged by all of this, it's a good reminder that God has an active spirit in the life of his church and that he's going to continue to work. Um, so that's kind of what we see in this first row up top, um, talking about the image of Christ to each of these churches. And, and you'll notice that each of these images, they still can be incredibly helpful for us today to put before us as a reminder. So next we have a recognition of the church and this kind of builds up what the church is doing or what the church has done. So in Ephesus, enduring and hating evil. Um, and I guess before I go through all these, I, I think as far as what is it, what does this speak to us? I think this can build, this can be serve as an encouragement for us to be doing these things. If we're doing these things, we can take, we can kind of um, accept some of this recognition as, as an encouragement as oh, this is a good thing to be doing, um, enduring and hating evil suffering and, and poverty stricken, kind of recognizing that it's, it's tough to be a follower of Christ, um, faithful in the in the face of death, loving and serving our neighbor and our community, um, sanctification, we, we have clinging to the word and clinging to, to Christ, um, which are all good things that we should be doing. And I would say this is, is primarily an encouragement for those. Um, I'm not going to get into too much of a tangent on what all of those different things look like. Um, I think the one, I, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to three of these. Okay. And I could speak to all of them, but I think three of them warrant clarification because obviously in these, you know, four or five word summaries, I didn't go in as much depth. So the first one I want to talk about is hating evil. 
This does not mean that you go on Facebook and start denouncing people and insulting people. We're told not to do that, like explicitly not to do that. Christ says even, even those who call their neighbors fools are, are going to be harshly judged um, because we're, we're called to be loving and kind in whatever we do. There, there's, and it's sometimes helpful, it's sometimes not, but there's a sentence out there, love the sinner, hate the sin. But the priority here is loving the sinner because we're all in that position of being fallen. But we are called to actively strive against sin. Um, so we have that, what, what I wouldn't want to see after you watch this is for you to go on Facebook or something or go up to your neighbor who um, maybe has a lifestyle or a habit that you you know to be a sin and to just go on a rampage against them because that's not what we're called to do. We're called to love them. And in, in context, a lot of this enduring and hating evil is is not letting that to allow... Uh, not allowing that to enter into your life. Um, so that's a, a bit of a tangent. Obviously, I could go on a huge rant about that, um, but this is not the time or the place. So stepping forward, we have suffering and poverty stricken. This is the other. This is the second of the three that I want to talk about quickly, um, because I think there is this tendency in Christianity, and I can't speak for global Christianity, but in American Christianity today, there's this tendency to say, if you are a faithful enough Christian, God is going to make things go your way. Um, and frankly, I think it's it's turned to more and more as people struggle to, to fill their pews. Like it's used as a recruitment, like, oh, your life's going to go better if you come join us. And that is not the reality, the, the reality is that we're promised as Christians, as faithful followers of Christ, we're going to suffer more, not less. Our lives are going to be tougher, not easier. And I think it's important that we're honest about that because say, say you are trying to get someone to come into church and you say your life is going to be easier if you join this church. What happens when the suffering that we're promised actually happens? They say this has been a bunch of bunk and they leave because of that suffering. We ought to be honest and upfront and say, like, you, this is a tough road to walk, but it's what we're called to because it's the truth. So um, that's a, a, another little soapbox. And then um, the last one that I want to speak to a little bit is Philadelphia, having clung to the word. This is the word of the gospel. This is the, the reality of Christ, um, first and foremost. Um, this isn't a, a exhortation or an encouragement to fundamentalism. And if you want to hear what I have to say about that, I would go back. I believe it's in Revelation 2 that I talk about fundamentalism at length. Um, spoiler alert, I'm not a fan, but I digress. So that's the recognition of the different things these churches have done Um and then we step into this thing that I think is incredibly important for us to cling to and recognize and look for in our own lives and in the churches that we attend. And that is danger. Because each of these dangers, it's not just a, like a generalized danger. This is a danger to the faith and as a result to the salvation of the people in those churches. So Ephesus we have, they've left off with love and service. They're, they're more inwardly focused and and their their faith isn't actually impacting their works. And in James, we're told faith without works is dead. And there's, the, there's this important clarification that your works are not what save you. Doing good things, doing good deeds, loving your neighbor, that is not what saves you. But if you have faith in Christ, the natural reaction to faithfully following Christ is good works. Does that make sense? Um, for for example, um, I am a huge Atlanta United fan. If you've never met me in person, um, you wouldn't know that. But if you have met me in, in person, there's a pretty good chance that at some point it came up. I'm a huge Atlanta United fan. I am a faithful United, Atlanta United fan. So naturally, I have jerseys. I watch a lot of their games. I spend time. I, I read articles. I do all of these things. 
I don't have to do any of those things to be a fan, but as a fan, it's kind of natural that I follow through and I do these things because of my fanhood fandom for the team. In the same way, when you're faithful in Christ, you, he tells you to do certain things, and if you're, you're faithful, you're like, well, duh, I'm going to try and do these things. So we try and go forward to live as he's taught us to. Um, and that's just saying, if you leave that stuff off, your faith is going to wither. Um, next we have Smyrna, they fear suffering. And this is something I, I, I spoke to a little bit in when we were talking about recognition. There's a reality that if we fear suffering, then when suffering comes, like it's promised that it's going to come to faithful Christians, there's a greater tendency that we're going to fall away. So I guess my encouragement in this is make peace with the reality of suffering. Um, the next one is this idea of idolatry and cheap grace, this I, this. And cheap grace, in, in case you're you're not familiar with that um, phrasing, is that is this idea that well God's going to forgive me anyway, so I can do whatever I want. No, um, if you increasingly allow yourself to fall into idolatry, which today looks like things like idolizing money and employment and the social groups we're a part of and uh, kids, idolatry of ki of your kids is a huge thing in our society today. The idea of, I would do anything for my kids. Like, that's idolatry on some level. Um, idolatry of status, idolatry of political parties, idolatry of ideologies. Um, I could go on and on about all the things that our society idolizes today, but the more you let yourself step into those idols, the further you're stepping away from faithfully following Christ. And that's why it's a danger to the faith. Um, Thyatira tolerating evil people in the church. And, and what this kind of speaks to is this idea that like, if you have evil in the church and you don't do anything about it, it's going to become more and more and more of a problem. Um, so we, we have to speak to that. Um, step in, and if you want more on that, what I would encourage you to do, you're on St. Paul's YouTube page, so go to St. Paul's YouTube channel, and there, there are a bunch, if you go to the channel homepage, there are a bunch of playlists. You have worship, you have devotions, you have my Bible study, you have Pastor Andrew's Bible study, you have school programming, you have school chapels, etc., etc. This is kind of a plug for the channel as a whole. Um, but if you go far enough down, there's a, uh, a playlist called Real Life, Real Gospel, and it's a series of podcasts. And one of those podcasts is on conflict resolution. And I think when it comes to tolerating evil people in the church, that podcast is especially helpful. Um, and it's like 25, 30 minutes long, so I would encourage you to listen to that because I'm not going to um, take 25 or 30 minutes to step out and do that here. Um, and then in started stepping forward in these dangers, they look alive, but they're dead inside this idea of like, we're doing good things because we like doing good things, not, but we're not taking care of our faith. So this is kind of the opposite of Ephesus. Like you, you have to, we, we ought to be faithfully doing good things and trying to live as Christ would have us live, but we can't neglect our faith and building up our faith. So we have that. Um, next we have Philadelphia, not taking it advantage of opportunities to serve. That's a little bit more in line with the danger Ephesus is facing. And then in Laodicea, we get the most scathing danger, and that is you are lukewarm in the faith. And this is the idea that if you're hot in the faith, you're like, you're acting out your faith, you're living in the faith, you're seeking to deepen your relationship with Christ, and that is phenomenal. You are in a good spot. On the flip side, if you are cold in the faith, you're outside the faith, you, you don't attend church, you, you're, you are not visibly a Christian, which is not a terrible place to be because Christians who are hot in the faith are called to reach out to you. The real danger is when you are lukewarm, when you're kind of halfway. When you go to church and you're you're kind of there, so there are no like red flags like, hey, I need to be witness to, but you're not really seeking to deepen your faith. Your faith might not even really be there. It's just you go to church, so you, you go to church. That's just what you do. Um, 
And he strongly condemns that because the danger there, like you're not building your faith, it's withering, but no one sees that. So no one is going to reach out to and support you in that. Um, and I'm going to speak kind of, kind of harshly on this. Because I think in our society, we have this tendency of, I go to church on Sunday morning and that's enough. Anything else is bonus. But the reality is, you should be in Bible study. You should be in small groups. You should be seeking out community. So, for example, we have a, a men's Bible study. Uh, obviously not going on right now, but when that resumes, 6.30 in the morning on Tuesdays. What are you doing that is more important at 6.30 in the morning on Tuesdays than deepening your relationship with Christ? Are you sleeping? Are, are you trying to get into work a little early? Like, what, what does that communicate? You're not willing to sacrifice one morning to deepen your relationship with Christ? Like, it should be a priority. You should be in a Bible study, in a, in a small group. Uh, we've had a couple series uh, that have started small groups, and we have a couple small groups that meet on, on around St. Paul. You should be involved with one. You should be involved with other members of the church that are there to support your faith, to pray with you, to get into God's Word together. This is something you should do. It's not just like bonus points. Like You should be seeking to grow your faith. And I know I'm speaking kind of hard here, but like the, there is the reality. You should be doing devotions on a daily basis. You should be reading your Bible. You should be in Bible study. You should be in small groups. You should not be just lukewarm in your faith. You shouldn't be satisfied with just showing up for two hours on a Sunday morning. Like, just think about like percentage-wise, how much of your time are you spending in church, in a, in a week, you have, uh, for simplicity's sake, let's say, um, there are 20 hours in a day. I know there are 24, but just make the math really easy. That's 140 hours in a week. And you're spending two of them in church. That is less than 2% of your time. What does that communicate about your priorities? It is what it is. Um, so that's the danger to the faith in Laodicea. Uh, and moving forward to the promise God gives to the church that says, if you strive forward in the faith, if you strive to overcome these dangers, if you cling to those things that you've been recognized for, these are the promises for you. And they're, a lot, they're all very similar. You have access to the tree of life, promise of eternal life, uh, names in the book of life, pillar in God's temple, sit on Christ's throne. Those all point to... The promise of a place in heaven with God, uh, in, in a place with new creation with God. Um, connected to that, we also have the forgiveness and the communion um, that is being promised. Like, Christ is going to forgive you if we have faith in him, if we, if we are faithful even in the face of death, if we cling to God, there is forgiveness, and we're brought into communion with him and with all the saints. Um, we have this idea of ruling the nations. And again, this is pointing toward the end times. Um, if you look at, at the, the Bible studies we've released on Revelation 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, uh, toward the end, you see a lot more of that. Um, names in the Book of Life, we kind of already covered. Pillar in God's temple, that's a secure place in God's temple. Um, so all these promises are pointing towards eternal life towards communion with God and forgiveness through him. So that's kind of what we see in promises. And then with all of that in mind, that is what that, those were the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And a lot of those, as you have seen, apply to us today. But what I would what I would say is we could probably write a letter to the church at St. Paul. Um, and those are the questions I have below. And, and if you are if you would like to be involved with this discussion, I would encourage you, post below this video. Um, what is the image of Christ that we need put before us? What's something that, as a church, we could be recognized for? What's a danger to our church? Um, what promises of drive God drive us forward? And some of the things that came up, um, the, the conversation when I did this in person was primarily around 
what's something we can be recognized for and then what's a danger to the church and um i don't remember a ton of that conversation because it was months ago but i do remember something we could be recognized for there's a lot of love in this congregation which is so very true this congregation loves to love there's love there's service there's the school ministry all of those are phenomenal things we can be recognized for what is a danger to our church and resoundingly complacency so um, i would i would encourage you answer some of those questions answer all of those questions below because i think it is worth our time to consider these questions um, and if you're not a member of St. Paul, still feel free to engage in the discussion. What are the dangers of your church? What's, what are things your church can be recognized for? What promises of God are, are profoundly impactful at your church? Because those can be helpful to other people watching this video, whether, um, whether they go to your church or not. So that is what I have for you. That has been kind of a summary of the, of the letters for Revelation 1 through 3, the letters to the churches. Um, check back next week. We will get into Revelation 4. We will continue to step through um, Revelation. And I would encourage you, subscribe. Subscribe to St. Paul Lutheran Church and School on YouTube um, because we have a ton. We have a ton of stuff. Uh, to help get you into the Word. Like I said, you know, we should be seeking to deepen our relationship with Christ. Um, worship services, devotions, Bible studies, chapel services for the kiddos. All that kind of stuff is available on this YouTube page. Take advantage of it. Get into the Word with us. We, we'd love to have you. So go ahead and subscribe. Um, and I guess if, if this video was helpful for you, if you think it gave you something good to think about, go ahead and like it. Give us that uh gratification i guess a little bit of a shameless plug there um anyway this has been uh, another step forward in the revelation bible study uh by hosted by saint paul lutheran church and school here in boca raton florida i'm josh and it's been a pleasure speaking with you go in peace and serve the lord thanks be to god